The Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks, welcome back to Through the Scottish Prism weekend show. Hope you and yours are well. Um, again, been a heck of a week. Lots going on, lots happening. Um, lots to talk about, lots to think about. Some things to worry about and some things to be pleased about. And to help me, we do all that. I have my my, my usual crew in, in tow with me, and of course we have over there in North Dakota. He's back in North Dakota, away from the brig. Is our uh, Phil Boswell? Phil, my friend, how was your journey back to the US of A? It was nice, man. It was a good journey, a bit tight, but uh, fun. In so much that I got back on time and uh, no delays. Any Which jet lag? Is- Nah, it's like a, it's pretty decent, you know. It's like a, it's a great setup. I, I, I was traveling in the business, so it was good. I got yeah. some sleep time, so it you was were pissed, good. in other words. Very good, man. Proud of you. Uh, and also, they are up there in the like manager. We've got her, Eva. Eva, my friend, how are you? Hi, Roddy. I've had a wonderful week. I fulfilled a, a lifetime ambition the other night when I was able to speak personally to Jim Sillers, who had done the We Alba Book event with Alec in our growth. Um, it was a magnificent experience listening to the two of them, um, and obviously chaired by Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh. But to be able to speak to Jim afterwards and explain to him what an inspiration he and, of course, also his late wife, Margot MacDonald, had been on the Scottish political scene that really for my entire lifetime was something very, very special and for it to have happened in Arbroath um, after Alec made the new Arbroath declaration uh, was absolutely unforgettable. I've, I've got a shiver down my spine just now thinking mm. about it. So a very, very special week for me. Uh, Marg was one of my heroes as well. She was the first in 1974. I, I, I was living in the Gubbin constituency at the time and she was my MP for a very short space of time. And I had to wait till 2015 to get another SNP the way it was. But there you go. Um, great stuff. And down there on the borders, we have uh, our Yvonne. Yvonne, my friend, how are you? I'm great. Uh, Ramadan is finished. So Eid Mubarak to any Muslim listeners out there. And, um, of course, uh, today in uh, England, it's St. George's Day. Um, and it's my birthday, and I'm 65, and I'm one of those waspy women that should have been able to put my feet up and enjoy my pension. But under this government, I've got um, another year of hard labour to do with this work-till-you-drop ethic coming out of Westminster. Well, happy birthday to you, my friend. Many happy returns. Have a lovely day and a fantastic year. Thank you. And and uh, just as I mentioned St. George, he was actually born in Palestine. So St. George came over to these shores at the moment. Um, he would be arrested and bundled off to Rwanda. Yeah. So would Jesus Christ when you come to think of it. Ah, uh-huh. You're there right. You there you go. And uh, to make up the quartet of geniuses and Scottish political punditries, Extraordinaire. We are joined by none other than Lloyd Quinn in there in Old Ricky. Lloyd, Sunny friend, North welcome Berwick back. At the moment, Roddy. Oh, you're not in your oh, yeah. Sunny North, North Berwick. Yeah. Anywhere North outside North. of Glasgow's Edinburgh to me. Makes no difference. <laughs> welcome anyway. Great to see you folks. It's been a heck of a week again. Um I, I've got to say, as 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 people who frequent prison, we should be grateful for all this stuff they're giving us. Um if only it was good stuff. Um, but the big story, I suppose, of the week, we've got to say, um, and uh, I hope Techie can put up a little clip for us, was the arrest of the SNP treasurer, Colin Beatty. And it, there we go. Colin Beatty, um, he resigned um, as the treasurer and also come off the committee that he was on. Um, it, was not a shock, was it, Lloyd, when um, this actually happened? No, it wasn't a shock. I think the shock was, for me, that the third person who 
signs off the SNP accounts has not as yet been arrested. So for me, that was the biggest shock. Mm -hmm. um, Colin has clearly been a patsy for a number of years now. He's uh, He springs back into action as the glove puppet that he is when they required a new treasurer. But uh, he knew what was coming down the track. But uh, he strikes me as a very confused man, a very confused man. It, it wasn't his wisest thing, Phil, was it, to um, to come back in when Dougie Chapman had, you know, in the way Douglas had left, was saying there was no access and he wasn't getting access, and, and Joanna Cherry at the same time, who had reminded the members of the NEC that they'd all be joint and liable for anything that was wrong, and that's gone back several years. But Colin took up, you know, as a loyal SNP -er, and loyal moral sur surgeon uh, type of guy, not his wisest decision. No, I, I, well, I believe he went in. I believe he went in to cover up because he knew what was going on. Mm. So when your treasure is lifted for any company or any organisation, it's never a good sign. It's run for the hills time. Release without charge um, doesn't mean the inquiry is over and that he's innocent. Clearly, there are grounds for concern and the investigation continues. When it's over and there was no illegality, you get something like you had in the Alex Salmon case, a full acquittal. You know, so the trumped up uh, case against Alex Salmon, you get a full acquittal here. It's ongoing. We need to wait and see. And there's still many, uh, many an investigative uh, inquiry to be made. We need to take back control of our country. Then to have our people's judicial system fully investigate the salmon stitch up and prosecute all who lied but the, the stuff and that means cleaning out the institutions because they're they're fraught with corruption and this is why calling going back in is that doing nothing but to continue it's, it's part of the continuation set up and these institutions are, are are meant and set up to harm us last time i spoke to colin it was a year maybe two years ago in edinburgh and he was pretending to be a rebel Oh, how I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not proved that way. Eva, you're our legal eagle. Um, would you say that there is any chance that, that we've seen the last of the arrests, or is there more likely to happen? There's guaranteed to be more. Um, they must be on the cards. Uh, if you look at the SNP accounts, lodged for the Electoral Commission, they're signed in effect by three officers, two of whom we know have already been arrested and questioned. The third officer, who as far as we know has not been arrested or questioned, is Nicola Sturgeon, the former First Minister, obviously. So I would expect her to be questioned quite how soon that will take place, obviously, as anybody's guess. And I would expect that we will see a press release at some point from Police Scotland indicating that a 52-year-old woman has been arrested, questioned and released without charge. A report will go to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. So there'll be no surprises there. The only unknown thus far is the timing. Um, anybody paying attention to the news and especially watching developments in the last couple of years expertly and skillfully laid out by Stuart Campbell on Wings Over Scotland will know that there are several other people deserving of police attention, including my own MSP and former Justice Secretary Keith Brown, because he prepared a report on transparency for the party a couple of years ago, but the report barely saw the light of day, though mm. recommended the provision on a monthly basis to the NEC of accurate figures on sources of income and all aspects of expenditure. That would suggest to me that Keith, at that stage, saw practices or processes that he felt uncomfortable with, and he was recommending transparency then. But he, like so many others on the NEC and within the wider party, who knew what was going on, have stayed in the party and allowed whatever these practices are to be maintained. And so I think that the entire NEC qualifies to be questioned, and certainly so does Keith. And I would imagine um, Mike Russell must be on that list, and the party business convener, Kirsten Oswald, is guaranteed to be on it. So, you know, it's it's good for my friends in the legal profession. There's a lot of lucrative work. <coughs> 
And I would expect many of these folk in the SNP have already taken some preemptive action and sought advice. I think that they're well advised to do that before there's a chap at the door. Uh, Evelyn, um, despite invitations, um, we don't get very many, uh, in fact, we don't get any SNP high rankers coming on here, although we have invited them to come on. Um, but Ian Blackford earlier in the week went on to Times Radio, a well-known pro-independence newspaper, The Times' radio podcast, to tell all the viewers that there was nothing to see here. The finances were in fine fettle. Um, it was all overblown and um, exaggerated. It, deluded or just not, not absolutely nuts? Do you know, it took me back to 2003 and Baghdad when Comical Ali, the henchman of Saddam Hussein, was briefing the Western media every day. And, of course, we were watching Sky News and seeing the Americans invade shock and awe in Iraq. And journalists would say to Comical Ali, as he was nicknamed, uh, what about the American and the British invasion? And he said, I see no tanks. This is all lies. It's Well, he didn't say fake news, but he said it's all lies. And he actually endeared himself uh, to George W. Bush because he was so loyal. And listening to Ian Blackford slavering on, saying, oh, there's nothing to see here, reminded me of Comical Alley. Because we all know there's plenty to see there because somebody's already switched the fan on and everybody is being splattered by the brown stuff. And yet the SNP, like, it is like a cult, are saying this mantra, there's nothing to see, there's nothing wrong. Of course there's something wrong. And you're saying that Nicola Sturgeon hasn't been arrested yet. Well, I know two news desks in Fleet Street are working on the assumption that when she popped out of uh, Lilac Gardens or wherever it is, Lavender Gardens, where she lives, when she popped out, it was actually to make her way to the police station. She certainly wasn't going to Harvey Nicks. You know, she had a folder in her arm um, with some legal files there. And uh, what I found interesting about this whole thing and knowing how Fleet Street operates uh, is that uh, Mr. Sturrell came out in his car first and drove off. And the first thing I thought is this is a decoy. He's hoping to lead the press away from Lavender Muse and down after him while he's doing his shopping and uh, it will give her time to get out and go off to wherever, she, you know, whichever police station she'd been called to. There is no way Nicola Sturgeon was going to have the police come to her door. That was the money shot. And there is no way that she was going to allow that to happen. And so I, I reckon, and of course, at, at this point, I am speculating, but I reckon her lawyers have spoken to the police and said, we're not having you come into the door, we will come to you. And um, Eva might be able to back this up or say it's rubbish, I don't know, but I suspect that the lawyers have brokered this deal where she leaves the house and goes off to a police station, maybe of her choice, who knows. But she was not out on a shopping trip when she left her home. And so I think that uh, the horse has already bolted. I think that she's already been questioned and she was uh, released late on Thursday evening and went back home, having eluded the, um, the media who, you know, let's face it, were just standing outside her door like a collection of bookends. So, I think it, I think that sounds great, but I, I, I hate my doubts. But one for anything, if she's got a way of doing a deal, I think that will enrage people. 
And I would think that the procurator, again, Eve will tell us in a minute, but I think the procurator would have to make a statement saying that a 52-year-old woman has been arrested and questioned. They well, couldn't they, keep that quiet, could they, Eva? Eva, well, right, uh, there could be an opportunity arranged for her to attend the police station at an agreed um, time and probably also an agreed place. But I would expect that if that did happen, that there would still be a statement issued. I don't think there are any circumstances to justify secrecy around that just because she's a former First Minister. We've seen much more horrific treatment of a different former First Minister. Um, and whilst I hope that the police and the other authorities and certainly the media learned lessons from the events of a couple of years ago, I'm still confident enough in Scotland's democracy and its institutions to believe that if the immediate for, former First Minister was arrested and was questioned, that there would be a statement about her. Because after all, we're all equal in the eyes of the law. If we are not equal in the eyes of the law, then the state of Scottish justice is far worse than we fear. Indeed. I've just had a, a message in the private chat here from Techie to say um, someone raised this point and the police apparently have denied they have spoken to her today. Now, I don't know how much facts in that or not, but we'll find out. But Lloyd, um, as, as Ian was making this great, bold statement, everything's fine, everything's hunky-dory, the following day, I think it was, Pe Penny Monder Mordant um, got up in the House of Parliament. Hey, Techie, can you put up Penny's little speech informing the SNP of what's going to happen? The Honourable Lady raises the matter of the SNP and short money. And although uh, we all um, uh, enjoy a joke at the SNP's expense, these are really serious matters. And um, uh, I shan't comment on her suggestion about people being suspended under police investigation to save her blushes. It might have included the leader of the opposition uh, uh, who uh, has uh, been in that camp before. Um, but uh, these matters are not uh, a matter for me. Uh, but I understand that uh, unless the SNP have audited accounts by the 31st of May, they will lose their short money after the April payment. And I understand also uh, that IPSA may also have considerations to make. I think the SNP's membership will feel rightly let down by this, um, similar to how the rest of Scotland will feel uh, with the SNP's poor stewardship of public money. On the upside, though, I guess it will be easier for them to have a whip round amongst their membership as uh, that number is dwindling to the point where most of them could fit into, um, well, a luxury camper van. The uh, Honourable... Uh, embarrassing and makes me angry, Lloyd, that the SNP have put us in a position where uh, second-rate politicians from the Tory party can make jokes and humiliate our country and our so-called party of independence. It's disgusting. It's, it's a classic example of a situation where people have depended on one or two people as the great founts of knowledge for seven, eight years now. As a result of that, they've lost the ability to critically think. They've lost the ability to be able to analyse the circumstances they find themselves in. But most importantly, in that drive for loyalty, Effectively, we have elected representatives in our country, members of the Scottish National Party, who are frankly not fit for office because they were only fit for office in the party's terms for their loyalty and their failure to ask questions. Now, the party finds itself a hollow husk with people who do not have the ability, the intelligence, the political noose to take the action required to remove this embarrassment from our country. In days gone by, and I know he's been given a certain amount of credit for statements he's made this week, but in years gone by, the likes of Fergus Ewing, with his family name and his experience of the party, would have gone and knocked on the door of the leader and said to him what needs to be said, which is, this is all over. We have to admit we've got things badly wrong over the past eight years and we need to go back to square one. We need to be honest with the people. We need to be clear with the people that the legacy of the past eight years of the Scottish National Party is toxic from top to bottom. Now, 
it's quite sad, uh, Phil. And while Ian was trying to tell us nothing to see here, move along, folks, our new First Minister was doing a similar thing up in Edinburgh, where he, he was saying that uh, it was as if, you know, there's no rush and, you know, everything's under control. And, you know, as if he was being either, I don't know, complacent or he is not compass mentis and understanding the gravity um, of the situation he and his party find themselves in. Yeah, he's basically lying. Uh, Hamza, you, you're, you, he's just Mr. Continuity and he's, he's completely, you can't you can't believe a word he says on this. And Ian Blackford's the same. I'm sorry, Ian. Time to stand down for all of you. But the, the seriousness of this cannot be overstated. I mean, Penny, I know, and she will relish, she delivered that written, that speech written for her with, with relish. You know, you can get the SNP into a camper van. She's loving all of that. She loves the attention. But Penny, she confirmed this is one and a half million of short money as payment to the parliamentary party for having the level of representation that the people of Scotland have voted the SNP to make at Westminster. This is critical to the functionality of SNP and they lose it if, if the accounts are not submitted by the end of May. Now, the, how critical this is to the functionality of SNP is also must be understood because this, being there in 2015, it was the biggest focus. We couldn't believe it went from a handful up to 56 in 2015. And the, and the, all, the whole SNP went up two, three gears to focus on how we get this money in, what we have to do to get this money in and what we're going to do when we get it. So it, it got their full attention and gets it every single year. We were all pressured um, to sign up to make a, a contribution, substantial contribution above and beyond the short money uh, to make sure the SNP went from strength to, set to strength. And uh, the, the, this money is responsible for funding the massive organisational growth we saw after 2015 within the SNP ranks. What's a disgrace though to all concerned is that this was not spent on pursuing the cause of independence. No, it was not. Rather, wallpaper, feeding the greedy, mates, and the general reversing away from any policy or activity that would free the people of Scotland. Penny also mentioned IPSA. Now, people need to understand that IPSA is responsible for setting the level and paying MPs, right? Annual salaries, etc and the staff so all your staffing costs goes through it so all your payments are um monitored but they also review and administer mp's allowance schemes okay and providing with the uh, public available information related to taxation um, and it also determines uh, the procedures for investigation and complaints so it's quite a broad mandate that it has and what it means is that what it is, it's a, it's a cloaked threat. It's not even cloaked. They're just telling you, Ipsa will be looking into this, are looking into this. And given that it's in the establishment's best interest to discredit the SNP and Scottish independence and the independence movement, we need to be clear. Everyone in the SNP who's continuing to try and cover this up instead of blowing it away and fixing it and starting again, getting the big clear out, you're a traitor to the cause of the independence of the Scottish people. And you must go, you must, in fact, we need to tear it down. We must tear it down and rebuild it if we're serious about freeing the people and our nation. Um, Eva, like, keeping on this theme, um, and, and in the middle of the week, Humza as well, when was getting questioned about this, I mean, he seems to love the camera and he goes in against un, un, unprepared. I mean, he's playing the big I am, but he really, Someone needs to get a hold of him and say, just be quiet, no comment, or, you know, I don't want to comment. But on the, the question of Nicola Sturgeon or, or Peter Morell being suspended, which is disgraceful that certainly Peter Morell has not already been suspended. I mean, uh, not just for the police inquiry, but for the fact that there was a camper van bought without NEC approval, should have been an instant dismissal uh, offence and his, his membership removed. The same with not telling the party for six months about the auditors. Again, that's an instant dismissal and removed, but he's not. But when he was asked about it, Holmes just said, I've got to make sure I don't mis misquote 
But he said that, you know, are we, are we still at the stage where a wife gets held responsible for her husband's actions? Um, I mean, it, it is incredible that, he, that such a thing that Humza would say. Well, um, in line with, with what Phil was just saying there, Roddy, the problem for Humza is that he really does need to come clean and face facts and admit reality. Um, Robin McAlpine, obviously a great friend of the show and a very clever, wise man, has written several times recently about the problems within the party. And he says time after time after time that we are not going to advance the cause of Scottish independence as quickly or as well or as forcefully as we need to when the main party of government is mired in what is really at the moment such a, a dreadful, foreseeable, but previously unimaginable mess. And Hamza's training or the advice that he's getting seem woefully inadequate, to put it mildly. You know, one of the questions he was asked, I think, was, um, is, is there criminal or has there been criminal activity in the party? And instead of having the political skill to divert that and take attention onto something positive about the party or about this programme for government, his response was to say, no, I don't think there's anything criminal in the party. Of course there's not. Thereby reinforcing in the eyes of the viewer the word criminal. And he tends to do that every time that he's asked about something controversial because he's not got anybody reliable round about him to give him sensible advice that he's able to take and act on. So I don't necessarily agree that people who've been questioned by the police should be suspended. Um, I think they should suspend themselves. Um, I don't necessarily think they should be sacked, but there should be processes that are put in place. And what we suspect from what we've seen from Hamza so far is that there's been, I think, two meetings of the NEC since he became leader, and neither of these has actually got the bit properly between the teeth. There's the prison dogs again. Um, so there's to be a report in a few weeks' time and a follow-up report in a couple of months, but actually that's not good enough. Um, if I was a member of the SNP, I'd be chapping Humza's door because I'd be demanding to see real action. So that's denied to me, but as a member of the Scottish electorate, as somebody who voted SNP last year and the year before, and as someone with a great interest in politics, I'm disappointed every single day that this continuity candidate is completely and totally unable to distinguish himself from the conduct and the behaviour of his predecessor. It still feels as if she's working him from the back. It feels like he's a puppet. Now, if he wants to get away from that, he should get shot of the people that are in his cabinet that were Sturgeonites. He should get a new NEC in place. They can be elected by the membership pretty quickly. And he should have a different process for appointing a new chief executive officer. The current acting chief executive officer is tainted by her involvement in the Alex Salmond affair. There's substantial information about her online. She just shouldn't be there. He should depart from the past and he should do it now. He's not going to do that. And if he doesn't do it, the SNP will continue to sink in the polls. But as they sink, the um, support for Scottish independence is either remaining constant or it is beginning to increase. And that's when the SNP are behaving so very badly. So if their raison d'etre is Scottish independence, clear out the stables, Hamza, do it today, and then let's have a united Scottish independence movement, a one Scotland, a Scotland united process for both Westminster and the next Holyrood elections. That's what's needed. But will he do it? I very much doubt, but I'd like to be surprised. Um, yeah, we all would. Uh, everyone, you know, Holmes again stood in front of the cameras after that NEC meeting that Ivory um, was referring to and trying to look very as if he was in total command and everything's fine. He said, you know, I've, I've told them to go and do a, um, we're doing a transparency, we're going to look into that, we'll set up a committee and it will give us an interim report in June and the final report in October, which will then be put in front of the conference in October um, for ratification um, or remitted back, who knows? Um, but as we just heard from Pen Penny Morden, if they don't have their audited accounts for the 31st of May, no 
no more short money. No more short money means no more money for the employees. And I believe there's over 200 of them. It means that they're absolutely screwed. They can't wait till June. They can't wait till October. But there doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency to do what needs to be done. I mean, they can't even get new auditors in unless they do something urgent and different immediately. I think the very real truth of it all, if you follow Penny Morden's line, is there won't be an October conference because there won't be an SNP. And this is because of the blind patriotism shown by the grassroots membership. And I would urge the membership of the SNP, rise up and seize your party back. Deselect all of those MPs who have made fun of you. Deselect them all. The membership has got to show some teeth if it is to rescue its party. You know, this party was once one of the greatest democratic parties in the whole of the UK. It led the way in the way that it did everything. It was admired universally in the way that its constitution was made. And the likes of Sturgeon, Morell, um, all of them, uh, you know, they have set about dismantling the power of the NEC, dismantling the power of the membership, the membership has got to grow a spine, rise up and seize the party back again before it's too late. In fact, it might be too late now. You know, what we're watching, it's like a police drama. It's, it's a, a, a mixture between Line of Duty and The Sopranos. You know, th these people have brought the party into disrepute, which, as we know, has been used against countless SNP members who've been expelled like that. So I think Humza needs to grow a pair and suspend pending investigation, which is fair enough. Uh, Murrell, uh, Sturgeon, uh, Kirsten Oswald. I mean, she is uh, a, a very senior figure who sought to you know, she was an unelected member of the NEC, planted in there by Chief Mammy herself. And she sought to shut up Keith Brown, which doesn't take much doing because he's spineless as well. And when he produced that report, it never saw the light of day. He needs to stand up and grow a spine. Do you know, I've never known so many people senior people in, in Scottish politics with the backbone of an amoeba. The, the grassroots are blindly loyal um, and blind patriotism, is it, it does nobody any favours. Um, so the, the membership are acting as though they're in the uh, Mooney-style cult and the senior politicians, as I say, are acting like the Sopranos, a cross between the Sopranos and, you know, Chief Mummy is, 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 is like the the head of an organized crime group. The way that things um, are looking at the moment, obviously that won't be true. Well, so we're, we're led to believe. But um, these are perilous times for the SNP and for bloated, pompous people like Ian Blackford to stand up and say, no, there's nothing to see here. Stop treating us like bloody idiots because we're not. We see you, Blackford, and we see the corrupt, sleaze-ridden lot of you in the SNP. So just start telling the truth because, you know, this isn't a crime drama. This is real life. Indeed. Um Lloyd, I'm just, I don't know if you saw the, the, the video that was doing the rounds on, on the internet of Nicola at the NEC telling people to be quiet about the money. Um, Techie's got it. It's not the greatest sound quality, but there are subtitles on it. Techie, could you roll that for us? ...in this body when the party has frankly been teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Um, 
the party's never been in a stronger financial position than it is right now, um, and that's a reflection of our strength and our membership. So just a bit of context for us all to remember. Secondly, I'm not going to get into the details that for Douglas, that's what he's elected to do, and of course this body is the governing body of the party. But, you know, just be very careful, uh, all of us, about suggestions that there are problems with the party's finances, because we depend on donors to donate. There are no uh, reasons for people to be concerned about the party's finances, and all of us need to be careful about not suggesting that there is. Um, and lastly, we've got to be careful as an NEC. We don't reap what we sow. If we have leaks from this body, as I said earlier on, it limits the ability for open, free and frank discussion. Uh, this body is all, and this is the governing body of the party with the responsibility to pass a budget. Um, and if we, so in all the years I've been on it, there has been good quality, uh, detailed financial information given by national treasurers, and that's how it should be. But if there are leaks, as with everything else, it, that gets more difficult to do. So everybody has to be very clear a, a, about that. And, you know, if I was a betting person, and just to be clear, Alison, this is not directed at you in any way, shape or form, uh, but if I was a betting person, I would bet we'll see the statement that's just been read out out in public this afternoon. Um, so I hope I'm wrong about that, and it might do a great uh, benefit for the confidence we all have in the discussions we can have in this NEC if I am proved wrong about that. And I'm sure I won't be the only one looking to see whether that is the case or not. I'm not accusing you. I'm not pointing elbows, Alison, at anyone. Um, good old Alison. Um, that, with what we now know, Lloyd, and surely she must have known at the time, um, she was being openly dishonest at there's, there's no question about it, but if you've been in the bubble where anything and everything you say, the people around you behave as if it is the pearls of wisdom come down you know, from the mountain, then if you have a flawed character, and I believe she does have, then that leads to the position that we're in now. But I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to just bring something else up that came out in conversation earlier with both Eva and Yvonne. Now, the shambles that we're in, there's a political manoeuvre going on here from certain individuals. We're now moved away from the territory of fighting for independence and we're now to fight to protect devolution. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the agenda that has happened in a number of other independence parties across Europe over the past couple of decades where trouble, exterior trouble produces a circumstance where suddenly they become diverted onto a path which is the path of autonomy and devolution and away from the path of independence. And I've been sniffing this around senior members of the SNP for two decades now. One in particular, the president. The president's never been comfortable with independence. That's just a fact. And I, I see me in court, Mike. But the fact is, Underlying all of this, the shift towards the SNP is a devolutionist party in the same way as Convergencia and Unio was in Catalonia and, this, and the Basque National Party are in the Basque Country. That's the path we're being taken down, particularly by those who've been on the trip to Washington on the future leaders course. They're the ones who are using this language. Even the Greens are using this language because it suits them, because it's actually their agenda is to move away, to let the SNP become a devolutionist party that can constantly rail against Westminster without having to accept the responsibilities that come with being an international nation state. Now, the real reason we're in this circumstance, and I keep banging on about it, is because we had a vetting system which was based on loyalty to the individual leader. And if you didn't meet that criteria, then you were out the door. And that's why we're now in a circumstance where we have people who cannot think for themselves. Mm -hmm. They depended upon the fount of knowledge. You know, it's like that mad scene in H.G. Wells where the people who go to get their food from the, you know, from the, well, sorry, I'm babbling on now. But the fact is, what you've done, or what she has done, is created a drone army with an inability to think, removed all the critical voices. Yeah. And, and that's where, where we find ourselves. But the danger here is that there's a movement within to split the party along 
devolution and independence lines. They've tried to split the movement, but clearly from what opinion polls are telling us, that can't be done. But to remain and can provide for the future sinecures, there are those who will move the SNP to the same position as the devolutionist parties in Europe, of whom some of them are friends. Indeed. Um, going on to that, one, one of the reasons I was going to go on to that topic anyway, thanks for Lloyd for introducing it, giving me a great segue in here. Um, but Phil, two thirds, that come out in news again this week as well, two thirds of the special advisors and spads within the SNP are either spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends or family members. So they've all bought into this exact thing that Lloyd is talking about, because what I was going to mention was that uh, our Humza made his visionary speech on the day that Colin was actually um, arrested, which kind of took the, the shine off it a wee bit. But he had a 16-page a, a speech, uh, and in that, he didn't once mention the word independence. Not once. The, lead, the new leader of the Independence Party, let me repeat that, but anyone didn't hear, didn't once in his speech mention independence. It's exactly what Lloyd's talking about that they've, they've swiveled and pivoted away from independence. Yes, and he's in completely, he's been completely controlled by the state, by the establishment. He will do and say exactly what they want him to do and say, exactly what Nicola and this whole cabal have done. And the two-thirds special advisors and SPADs, and there's over 200, uh, I think, mm -hmm. um, it, we, we see this in politics. It's, it's one of the issues where, um, again, it, so we're looking at there's certain regulations around whether or not family members can or should work for MPs or MSPs, and there's certain rules laid down. It's certainly frowned upon because this kind of nepotism is exactly what uh, politics is uh, sadly renowned for. And what we wanted, what we wanted to do in '56, I. I uh, with the 56 we're doing 2015 i didn't bring anyone uh, any family members on board um i did bring people i trusted rather than i know i put it this way i know friends uh, uh, uh mps who are still mps who went along with with hiring who they were given by headquarters and these people lived to regret that they they were basically spied upon, manipulated, lied to. It's a it's a game. It's about power and control. That's what politics is about. So it's no surprise that spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, family, family friends, it is a symptom of the problem. Um, and we saw this, this rise exponentially after Nicola took over. It's not good enough. And it's the whole. And I, I looked at North North uh, Lanarkshire district fence, and I thought. You know, we, we had the whole nepotism with uh, Labour there, and they're still still in control. We briefly took control, but it was a bunch of shysters that we'd, we'd put in uh, to start to take over from Labour. It would have been exactly the same story. Um, and it, it really is... I, I, my mantra was, what is the point of changing the colour of the flag in the town hall if it's the same modus operandi? If mm -hmm. we truly want people... Who have the interests of the people and the country at heart then we need to break these molds not work within them yes there's an element and an argument and this is how the worm gets gets into you and how it turns you you get in there and thinking well i've got to be in the system to make it work now the whole the whole attitude that we went down in, tw in 2015 with was one of we're going to be the last mps here we're going to get independence we're going to get the hell out of here hmm. That very quickly changed. We the, the, the climax of that was when um, Mike Weir, who's a good man, incidentally, um, told us, right, we all need to start talking to European countries, other European countries, because we're going to go for it. It's time. And then it just petered out. And before you know, we we're getting different instructions. And the MSPs and the MPs were at completely different odds with one another. And it was about gaming, manipulation, power broking and who had the highest profile. It became, it became we, we very quickly saw that this was being controlled by a very, very small cabal f to serve their own interests and not the interests of the people of Scotland. No, uh, you're right. It's, and I was thinking about taking down people, friends. It's says, well, you didn't take me down there with those subsidised bars. Phil, can I go up messing <laughs> you and I? I mean, yeah. And on these unlimited expenses. Oh, nasty, nasty. 
Anyway, back to serious stuff. Because um, another thing that came out today, to move on slightly, but it comes back to the fact that they're thinking about the devolution and not moving quick enough either. Ireland, wee tiny island, wonderful island. They've got no oil, they've got no gas, they don't have whiskey. Well, they've got, they've got stuff they call whiskey, but not real whiskey, if you know what I mean. They don't have the gin, they don't have the, the tidal power, they don't have the renewables that we've got. They haven't been blessed with the natural resources that we've got. They're certainly smarter than us, but they don't have all the other other traits. But they announced a 2% a two percent, um, budget surplus, which they're putting towards their cost of living um, squeeze. We are good on Ireland. I'm envious, um, but I'm also in full of admiration, uh, Eva. This is what we should be talking about in this show, that we're not spending enough of the surplus on the people, we're spending it in somewhere else. Exactly. Um, Roddy, you know my partner Matt is Irish, so in the last 20 odd years I've been a regular visitor to Northern Ireland um, and to Ireland itself. And the improvement in their domestic circumstances and in their economy has been very, very noticeable. And it's really because Irish politicians know perfectly well that they're answerable to the electorate. And they just the, the electorate will not take shit, quite frankly. Um, and they expect to see improvements across the board, both in the economy and in public policy generally. Um, what's interesting about all of that, though, is that in a Scottish context, if you rewind to the application to the Supreme Court last year, when that was announced, so was the date of the No Ifs, No Buts independence referendum to take place on the 19th of October this year. So we had all these politicians from the SNP and, and to an extent the Greens publicising um, Nicola's words and we had the front page of the National, keep the date, put it in your diary, all this sort of stuff. Mm. So folk like you and I who were saying, well, I'm not so sure about this, I'm not confident that an application to the Supreme Court is the right way to go about it and are we not really going with a begging bowl to, to Westminster in effect again? So we saw the Supreme Court application, we saw the outcome, and the outcome of that was obviously, God, you reached Scots, calm down, you're getting nothing out of here. And instead of challenging that internationally, Nicola Sturgeon accepted it and turned the argument into not a fight for Scottish independence, but has been said by Lloyd and, and by Phil, defending Scotland's democracy. What the hell does that mean, defending Scotland's democracy? Because in Ireland, defending Irish democracy involves the politicians of the North and of Ireland saying to the British, we don't like what you've done with Brexit and we want decent treatment for Northern Ireland. And we want a deal for Northern Ireland that suits the people of Northern Ireland. And that's exactly what they're getting. Scotland's not getting that. And the reason for that is that the Westminster politicians do not fear the SNP and they do not fear the Scottish people. And what Nicola Sturgeon and Humza in the last few weeks have succeeded in doing is turning Scottish politics and the Scottish independence movement into what it was prior to Jim Sillers winning governor in 1988, and that is a laughing stock. It was the victory in the Govan by-election that made Westminster sit up and take notice of the mm -hmm. Scottish independence movement and particularly the SNP. So where we are in Scotland now is a pivotal moment where the SNP have got to act and act like they mean business, not be the compliant, suppliant, um, polite, politely spoken politicians with their feet firmly under the Westminster table. Tommy Shepherd in a speech a few years ago said in Westminster, in, in the House of Commons, we've not come here to be disruptive. We've come, come to be good here parliamentarians. To be, we're going to be good little parliamentarians. Sinn Fein took a landslide victory in 1919 because they meant business. And in Scotland, we need politicians who, as, as Yvonne said earlier, are not spineless jellyfish. We seem to have spineless jellyfish at the moment. We've got support for Scottish independence pretty well remained static throughout Nicola Sturgeon's reign. We have drugs deaths that remain the highest in Europe. We have premature death as the result of alcoholism remaining far too high. We've got a complete and utter guddle in relation to ferries. 
education issues. There are difficulties across the board because we're not governed by politicians who are serious, who know their stuff, but are content to make sure that there are a couple of hundred jobs for the boys and girls of the gravy bus. And that is what Scotland needs to eradicate overnight or it will be left to the likes of us in the Alba party or the Independence for Scotland party or no parties, they all under one banner to continue to shout for Scottish independence because the party that's no doing it is the party of government that promised it. Indeed, on that, that topic there, Yvonne, um, on the 23rd of November last year, the Supreme Court made its decision and Nicola, who was the leader obviously at the time, said, well, we're not going to rush to make a decision. We'll wait 119 days till March and we'll have a spring conference, we'll have a special conference and we'll work out a reaction to it. Um, we know that within hours of the GRRD bill being rejected, they were already on the case and the first action that Humza took was to say that he's going to fight the Section 35 order. The special conference is just sort of, oh, God, no one talks about a special conference. Not, not one of them has addressed the fact of what the Supreme Court said in November. It's as if they don't care. You're, you're muted. They don't care. And the proof is in every conference that they've had in recent years. When has independence been up there for discussion? When has it been on the agenda? When have um, branches been allowed to raise the issue of independence and put it up on the agenda to have some real rip-roaring discussions, which is what the SNP was known for. Now it's just one stepfordized movement where the members sit there and clap like seals and the great and the good are sitting on stage looking down. It, it, it's like a mini uh, version of the Chinese Politburo, you know, the way the all the, the bosses are, start, are sitting there looking down on the proletariat. The, the biggest clue um, about a party, a political party, seriousness towards independence is look at the agenda. If independence isn't in the top three, four subjects, they're not serious. And unfortunately, the SNP lost its appetite for independence years ago. And not one of the membership that remained, because those of us who saw it just jumped ship straight away, those that remained have just not seen it and they have been duped. And they're still trying to prop up this falling house of cards. And I would say to the SNP membership again, if you want to rescue your party, if you really are serious about independence, rise up and get rid of the corrupt, rancid leadership that you've got now. And you can do it. You, you, there are great lawyers out there who should be able to represent the membership in a class action. In fact, anybody who gave money towards the independence fund that the SNP started, they should collectively get together and have a class action and demand their money back because it has not been spent on independence at all. They haven't even put it up in the agenda for their various conferences. The party is a fraud. It does not represent independence. And if you think it does, then your head must be zipped up at the back. It's quite rare about parties that are on, uh, take independence seriously. And I've seen a wee draft uh, agenda and uh, there's a, a party meeting in Inverness in a few weeks' time where independence is front and centre. That would be the Alipa party. But leaving that aside, um, Lloyd, the other side of the... We started this on the, the Irish surplus to subsidise what's happening in, in, in the cost of living crisis. The Joseph Roundry... Foundation this week announced that 460,000 Scots out of a population of 5.2 million are living in very deep poverty. 
um, and it's risen by 50% since 1997. Um, and instead of addressing that burning issue of poverty, which leads into drugs and alcoholism and premature death, we've been off in tangents on GRA, on the deposit return scheme, and God knows what other nonsense. Um, that is what's the problem. They've not focused on what needs focusing upon. Absolutely, but they, they can't focus on what's, what needs to be fixed because we don't control the economy and we're not an independent country. So they find themselves in this management position that they have where they look around for things to do. They're looking around for, for policies to create. And then certain nefarious individuals will tap them on the shoulder and say, here, how about this? Why don't you go along with the American State Department and everything in North America and bring in alterations to your Equality Act? create a gender recognition certificate. You know, all, all of this happens because of devolution. And I said it, I think, in the first programme. In some ways, George Robertson was right. Devolution would kill the SNP. I think that's what we're witnessing. And what's happening is it didn't do it itself. It's been manipulated into the position, as Phil has clearly explained to us about what happened in Westminster over the, the past few weeks. But what's, what, what genuinely is happening here is... They're people without politics. I know I keep saying this, but they're, they, you know, I'm, I'm a search for somebody who uses the socialism word or a search for, you know, they use the equality word all the time for whatever that means. They use the progressive word. Now, when I was growing up, the progressives were the slightly liberal-minded element of the Scottish Conservative Party, in actual fact, if any of these people had read a book. Now, it, it, it's an absurd situation. In the end, with autonomy, if you don't have bar borrowing powers, then you're scraping around in your settlement trying to find things to do because you can't address the issues of poverty unless you control the economy. You can't address education unless you control the economy. It's all very, very simple. And it comes back to the core belief that the answer to the principal problems of, of our country and the, the, the needs of our people lies in becoming an independent country with all of the levers that come with that. Now, it's a simple thing. But the Scottish National Party appears to have forgotten that that's the simple answer in most cases. I believed right at the very beginning, the day we went into Holyrood, we should have been getting in there and saying, yes, well, it's all very well doing that, but if we had the powers of an independent country, we'd be able to do 10 times more. Now, if we had done that from day one, right up until this very day, do you think we would still be an un-independent country? No, we would have been, because you cannot put out that message constantly, day in, day out, to the people, and it won't sink in, it will sink in. But the problem is the SNP employed an awful lot of people and selected an awful lot of people who frankly are embarrassed to talk about independence because they'd much rather get a pat in the back from the people they see as their superiors and betters, namely the British. And the first thing that the SNP has to do when it starts to reselect and deselect candidates is a Britishness test. Do you want to do British politics or do you want to do Scottish international politics? Because all we've got at the moment is a bunch of clowns carting themselves around like pantomime Brit politicians in their own little showbiz world. Well said, sir. Yeah. Phil, um, I, know, I know you've got comments you want to make about what Ireland's doing and what Ireland's managed to achieve. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it, again, it can't be understated. It's the, eco the economic impact to this. Ireland's partition is just, was over 100 years old now, right? And uh, the, it's the best example as to why Scotland should be independent. And when you look at the figures, the GDP PPP adjusted, which means uh, purchasing power parity adjusted, there's, um, you can you can get it. I, the last figures I looked at were, were, were geo, georank or, or, but there's lots of different uh, sites you can go on. But even just look at uh, the what's available on the internet. If you look at Reuters reporting on this, it, it recorded a, a budget surplus of around 2% of G, gross national income in 22. One of the few expected across the U, EU at this time, especially at this time of what's going on just now with, with Ukraine and the war in Russia and the, the proxy war, and the economic impact of these 
backfiring sanctions. <clears throat> but it's far in excess of the 0.4 projected three months ago, 0.4%. Now, this comes from the finance ministry. It's 5.2 billion euro surplus. Surplus. It's a turnaround in, of a de deficit of 7 billion euros, or a 3% of uh, gross national income uh, deficit in 2021 reflecting the fall in spending related to COVID. That was that was the COVID impact. This is the recovery after COVID. And this is a, a and, and you know, I'll, I'll finish the figures before I make the political point. Um, and I'm going into the, the, the GeoRank folder, which I've got up here. The GDP per capita PPP adjusted for Ireland is 79,000 per person versus 46,000 per person in the UK. Why is that significant? Because at the time on partition, uh, Guinness and a biscuit factory were pretty much all that Ireland had. It was the poor relative. And approximately twice as rich was the North because it was part of Britain. After the Second World War, the North stopped paying for itself and became a burden on the United Kingdom. You fast forward to now, and the South or area is twice as rich as the North of Ireland. It's completely turned head over heels. Why that has happened and and what enabled this to happen is very simple. You've got the Northern Irish, the Southern Irish, ostensibly Celts, the same kind of people, some Scots Irish, but it's the same people. And left to their own devices in the South, they built their own institutions, made their own applications and looked after themselves. And they went from half of the North to twice of the North. In the North, they became dependent on Britain and all you have to do look at is Arlene Foster's begging for the extra billion to support to support the the unionists and the Tories in government. How far did that get them? Nowhere. It's got them nowhere. So what you've got is the the biggest exercise, practical exercise as to why Scotland should be an independent nation. You stand on your own two feet. You look after your own. Uh, uh, you set up your own institutions. You clear out the corrupt ones that are that are manipulating you. And there was a brilliant radio show, and uh, it's a YouTube as well. I've, I've put it up before. I'll dig it out. But an Irish economist illustrated this. This is this, this was articulated brilliantly by an Irish economist. I'll get it up, and we'll, we'll dig out and put it on the show. But. Now, Ireland has shown us up and fair play to them. Yeah, because they've got self governance and they don't have London wrapped around their neck. It's yep. as simple as that. And they've done that, as I said earlier, without the resources that we have. You know, the people need to wake up. They really do. Um, and we're, we're overshooting the runway again, but we'll go for a couple more minutes, a couple more things to do. It was this week, uh, Eva, in, in, in North America, where I've got to say our Irish friends have worked their diaspora much better than we have. Um, and it was Tartan Day. But, um, Techie, can you put up that uh, picture of Scots? And there we go. Now, you'll see if we go if I go from the left to the right here, Tory, 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 Labour. And the guy at the back there with his shoes on with his, is a Mr. Pete Washer, standing behind a union flag with, you know, British whiskey, is it, Mr. Washer, surrounded by Tories. Embarrassing. To say the least, is it not? I have never willingly had my photo taken with a Union Jack. I've said before, I don't like to buy produce with a Union Jack on it. You know the story, if it's got a Jack, put it back. Put it back. Right? And it's because it's a symbol. And it's a symbol of all that Britishness. And I, and I really like the Britishness test that Lloyd mentioned there. I think that's fantastic. Um, exactly, exactly what we should do for all Scottish independence-minded politicians. But, you know, Tartan Day was invented to promote Scotland. And I, I really struggle to see how you're promoting Scotland in New York if you're standing behind a Union Jack. Because nobody on the planet believes for one tiny moment that the Union Jack's purpose is to promote anything Scottish unless there's a benefit in it for Britain. So the more that you stand behind the Union Jack, the more that you do down Scotland. We should have had a contingent of Scots there waving their salt tires, dressed in tartan, but delivering the strong message that Scotland is open for business. 
and we should have had Scottish politicians making speeches about Scottish independence, not attending fancy buffets where they were sipping Scotch whisky or nibbling Scottish shortbread. They should have been talking with force and with power about what it is that Scotland needs, and they should have been looking for support internationally to fight the Brits on the ground of Scottish independence. Not having what was in effect a fancy wee trade fair where we were all pals together. It's embarrassing. And it's events like that that lead to people criticising SNP politicians who look like they're far too cosy with their colonial oppressors, in fact, is what it is. And that's what's wrong. We need to learn to call it out whenever we see it. So I don't like to get into a slanging match to Pete Wishart. I do. People in my party has been full of hatred. I'm not full of hatred, but I do despise house jocks. And I think I've seen them once too often for comfort this week. Indeed. I'm going to come back to the second day, one, if I may. I'd just like to go to you, Lloyd, uh, because, again, the clock's kicking on. But uh, brought to, brought, you brought it to my attention that uh, Stephen Flynn, the leader of the, the SNP group in, in London, had a meeting with the Spanish ambassador. Yeah. And from that... Um, did we deduce anything that anything else happened coincidentally? Well, I'm sure he put the case for the democratic deficit that there is towards the Catalan, the Galician and the Basque people. I'm sure he put it in the strongest possible terms because it's well known that Mr Flynn has one of the greatest grasps of European politics of any of the SNP group. That aside, this week, another international event organised by the new SNP, which was the uh, the YSI organised an international conference. The only attendees came from Scotland, two from Wales, and one from the German SPT, SDP party. Nobody from Catalonia, nobody from Brittany, nobody from the Basque Country, Corsica, Catalonia, all those friends. We saw their flags on our marches in 2014 and since then. No contact whatsoever with the Irish. What is going on? But then again, the, the central issue here is the individual organising the, uh, the this international conference is a certain Olaf Stando, the ex-general secretary of the European Union of Jewish Students. Now, I know straightforwardly that if you contacted the Catalan youth independence movement, the Sardinians, the Corsicans, the Bretons, the Basques, and they knew that you were a self-declared Zionist, you'd get short shrift. And I think that was proved by that ridiculous picture on the front page of The National on Monday, where you had 14 spotty white boys standing, holding no flags, but declaring that they'd made a declaration on the top of Carlton Hill. This is the representation on the international stage from the SNP, led by a self-declared Zionist. This is an absurdity. How dare the Scottish National Party present our young people, our young people, to the world as people who support what's currently going on in Palestine, especially today on this St George's Day, the day of the patron saint of the Palestinian people and indeed of the Catalan people. But I'm sure Stephen Flynn knew that and exchanged those greetings with the Spanish ambassador. The SNP has lost its way completely in terms of its international connections. It wants to make international connections that say we are good devolutionist boys. Look at us. We'll become the PNV. We will become the autonomy parties. We do no longer seek membership of the United Nations. This is where this SNP has taken us. And this is what eight years of effective dictatorship within the party has taken us. It's sad. Yeah. To start to swing things back, everyone, there's one thing we need to be doing. And that's letting the people know that we're, we're back in business. And that I will allow you to make a wee advert for the, the All Under One Banner March in May the 6th. That's right. You know, let's uh, let's bring it home to Glasgow, um, a, a great, great city. Um, if you, and this is an appeal to every indie-loving person out there, which I believe is 99.9% .9 of PRISM viewers, if you are really serious about independence, come hell and high water, get
Get to the All Under One Banner March in May. Um, forget the coronation. That's just some little cosmetic pimple on the face of Britannia. Uh, forget that and focus on independence. And the best way to do it, the best message that we can send to Westminster is we want a divorce. We don't want to be with you anymore and turn up and march. And, you know, I was talking um, about Glasgow, what a great city it is. Um, I don't know whether Nicola Sturgeon's guilty of anything. I really don't. But what I do know she is guilty of is the neglect of children living in her constituency who are the poorest in the UK. Now, somebody mentioned Arlene Foster earlier on. Arlene Foster knew how to screw a deal out of the, the Westminster government. She got a billion pounds worth out of them um, and for a deal that went sour in the end. But she still got that money. And Nicola Sturgeon, what has she got for the children living in her constituency? The poorest in the UK? Absolutely nothing. Govan Hill West, that's her south side seat, has a child poverty rate nudging 70%. Now, as I said before, I don't know what she's guilty of, but this is criminal. Children in her constituency are starving. Mm -hmm. And she, as First Minister, should have been able to get some benefit for the people who elected her to power. You know, standing in that seat would be a great honour and she has turned her back on the voters. And uh, as I say, children, 70% in poverty. It's unbelievable. We're in the 21st century and children are starving, but 70% are in the poverty rate in her constituency. I don't know how Chief Mummy even dares to come out of our house and show her face to the media when there are statistics like that looming over. And this is the worst in both Scotland and the UK. And this was from a, a, a newspaper investigation, uh, which she never challenged a year ago uh, this month. And that is, um, this is in, in neighboring Govan Hill East, 58%, which is the second worst Scots area. What on earth is, is, you know, has she been doing? She hasn't been focusing on independence. She hasn't been focusing on poverty and children in need. She's been focusing on a vanity project, this useless GRR bill in which more money, which could be spent on the children of Govan Hill, it's been spaffed up the wall by her protege, Humza Yusuf. If I'm Indeed. sounding angry, it's because I'm bloody furious. We can tell. Um, and on the All Under One Banner March, if anyone's coming through from Edinburgh uh, and you're going to go for, for chips, you know, as a wee snack, bring your own brown sauce. We don't do that nonsense in the West. You'll get vinegar and like it. That's it. And if you're going to the Alapa conference on the 13th of May, remember that we're doing a, a, a prism from there with a live audience. We said live prism one time, never thought it was going to go out live, but no, we're doing a prism with a live audience. And we're doing that in the Beaufort Hotel at 6.30, no charge. There is a, a hooli after it, which you can stay for and buy a ticket for 15 quid. We're all be going to go to anyway, um, the prism team, um, and uh, we'll be drinking. I hope they get plenty of gin in, uh, and we'll be there. But until next week, in the midweek, um, well, I will have some new guests for you. And we're going to be discussing all the goings on in Ukraine and how we got there and what's happening now and the, the fallout for the world and what we in Scotland should be looking at. So midweek, I'll see you. But until this dear group of friends see you next week, please, please take care. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism.
Brought to you by Barhead Boy.